CSR is often viewed as expensive and done when an organization can without inconvenience. Therefore, in this podcast, we're going to ask, what do organizations really have to gain from social responsibility efforts? In making the business case for CSR, we will discover that the inherent value of social responsibility for any organization can go well beyond profit or loss or just a bit of charity work. By exploring the types of business cases that can be made for CSR, we're not going to focus on the relationship between CSR and financial performance. There's a lot of research pointing in that direction. However, I'm going to focus on the underlying assumptions and dominant approaches to building a more robust case for the importance of social responsibility. So we're going to take a look at the four traditional arguments for CSR and then build a better case for social responsibility. In looking at some of the meta-analyses of arguments that have been used over the last 30 years or so for why CSR should matter, four different arguments emerged. It's worth noting that CSR is not universally valued. It's been criticized from a lot of different directions. It's criticized from activists as being insincere or even counterproductive. It's criticized by some in business because the tangible financial results are frankly mixed. And so as a concept, and at the point that we may not even agree on a clear and unified definition of what CSR is, it's not surprising that it can be a difficult concept to apply, let alone build a rationale for supporting. So in the traditional business cases, we can make one of four arguments about the value that CSR can produce. So these are four different rationales for why an organization might want to produce some kind of CSR program. The first, cost and risk, risk reduction. Second, competitive advantage. Third, reputation and legitimacy. And fourth, synergistic value creation. We will define and explore each of these. But in order to understand and really compare and contrast these four arguments, we'll also have a set of evaluation criterion, a comparable set of standards for looking at the different arguments for CSR. So let's define each of these in a way that lets us better compare, contrast, and evaluate the business cases for CSR. First, key value proposition. This asks the simple question of how an organization differentiates itself from its competitors, and even independent of competition, what is the central value that it provides its critical stakeholders? Second, each argument for CSR will ask what the central role of business is. Very simply, what function does the organization serve society? Is it an economic? political, or social actor. In most cases, there are certainly economic, political, and social implications to the work that any organization does, but how is it primarily perceived within the argument for the case? Third is the level of theorizing. Think of this as the level to which what happens in an organization might be viewed as more universal. That is, what is its focus or its connection? Fourth, What's the dominant logic? That is, what is the set of values that grounds the argument for each of the cases for business interests? Whose interests are being served? This is concerned with identifying what's moral or ethical within the organizational environment, and this differs across the different cases for CSR. And finally, what's the ontology? That is, what is the core philosophy driving the organization's mission? Is it unequivocal? one that is materially grounded, or is it equivocal, one that is mission-driven with social influences? So, let's begin with the argument for CSR as cost and risk reduction. So, firms engaging in CSR are trying to do so to reduce costs or risks in some kind of way. Now, the key value proposition in this case is trading, and there are two ways that this is typically interpreted in the literature. First is the trade-off hypothesis, which was 
defined by Milton Friedman, supposing a negative impact of CSR on profitability, but it proposes there is an optimum point at which environmental and social performance can improve an organization's profitability. So it's about balancing the costs and the benefits. The second interpretation of the trading value proposition looks at available funds or slack resources. So this also assumes a trade-off view of social responsibility and financial performance by suggesting that when organizations are enjoying superior financial performance, that is, they have slack resources, they're able to dedicate additional resources to CSR. The implication in this approach is that firms perceive CSR as an additional cost, and so it's something they can only really afford to pursue if they don't have to minimize costs, that it's not something that necessarily leads to improved profitability, it's something that is good to do. Second, this suggests that the central role of business in the cost and risk reduction argument is for the economic actor. Instrumental theories argue that the central purpose for business is wealth creation. Therefore, their role in society is purely economic, suggesting that the chief purpose of business is to efficiently convert inputs to products and services in order to create financial wealth. And CSR are accepted as a means that narrow that end. So if we're thinking about the level of theory, we're thinking about an organizational level theory. Here we're just trying to describe and analyze inter interactions and effects at the organizational level. So if CSR activities have no direct impact on the firm, then they don't matter. The dominant logic behind this is therefore a normative economic logic, and it expresses value judgments about economic fairness that focus on the production of wealth in the long term. So of course, the cost and risk reduction argument sees the world and sees a, a material or objective reality. So it's aligned with the post-positivist approach and really emphasizes what is practical for the organization within this context. We compare that to the second argument or the second business case for social responsibility. Sometimes CSR is defined in terms of the competitive advantage that it can lead to for an organization. So the key value proposition here is somewhat different. It's adaptability. An adaptable strategic approach to CSR is to build relative competitive advantage over industry rivals. And there are a number of perspectives that complement this approach. For example, supply and demand theory suggests that firms will supply only the level of environmental and social performance that's demanded of them with a view to profit maximization. Second, uh, is the base of the pyramid approach. This is a way to examine how multinational firms might adapt to global drivers for change, such as population growth and poverty, in order to capitalize on the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And third is stakeholders for competitive advantage. This perspective argues that social and ethical resources and capabilities are conceived as internal organizational resources that build competitive advantage by enabling a strategic adaptation to the external environment. They focus on social responsibility as a competitive driver to strategically position a firm. So CSR initiatives that are taken on are those that complement the core competencies of the organization and adapt to stakeholders' expectations in order to generate sustainable performance with regard to stakeholder needs and the organization's own competitive advantage. So just like the cost and reduction um, argument, this focuses on the economic actor role, that business's role is purely economic. but it looks differently in terms of the level of theory to an industry level of theory, suggesting that this approach focuses on situating the organization within its larger competitive industry. It asks how the organization is performing relative to others within that industry. Like the cost and reduction, risk reduction approach, 
This is normative economic, but with this, the value proposition focuses more externally. What's valuable to important stakeholders becomes valuable to the organization. However, the competitive advantage perspective, see, in this perspective, CSR isn't driven by inherent interest in doing good, but by what stakeholders want. Likewise, this is an unequivocal view of the world, but typically more of a post-positivist approach because it views the world as changeable. So our knowledge of the world is based on our understanding of it that can be influenced by others and certainly can sometimes be imperfect. A third way of making the case for CSR's value to an organization is that it offers an organization a more positive reputation or legitimizes the organization and its activities. So the key value proposition in this case is alignment. What this argues that it is that CSR activities can be exploited to build value through gains in the organization's reputation and legitimacy. At the heart of any of these approaches is that an organization focuses on value creation as an activity that leverages gains in reputation made by aligning stakeholder interests and organizational activities. So there are a limited number of perspectives that might be explored using this approach. First is called the license to operate. This is linked with Davis's Iron Law of Responsibility and focuses on the idea that business is a social entity that must exercise responsible use of its power or risk having it revoked and so lose its control over its own decision making and external interactions. A second example of perspective is the social impact hypothesis. So the importance of alignment suggests, in this case, that a failure to meet stakeholder needs has a negative impact on firm reputation and suggests the cost of CSR activities is much less than its potential benefits. Third, is cause-related marketing. This highlights the alignment of stakeholder and organizational interests by linking corporate philanthropy, marketing, and public relations. In order for an organization to showcase socially and environmentally responsible behavior, businesses will partner most often with other organizations in the governmental or the nonprofit sector, but it can also just mean that the organization itself promotes a social cause. For example, studies on ethical purchasing behavior and green consumerism indicates that expectations for firms to behave environmentally responsibly have simply increased. So in addition, this lends itself to a differentiation strategy focusing on improving financial performance through enhancing reputation. A fourth example of a perspective that would adopt this, this approach is socially responsible investing. This emphasizes an alignment between a potential investor's ethics and expectations of corporate social performance, suggesting a relationship with reputation and market value. Studies on the attractiveness of corporations' prospective employers also emphasize the alignment between firm reputa reputation and its ability to attract talent. So this means that actors are... The central role of an organization or a business is as a political actor. So as political actor firms, of course, they still have a strong economic role, but this suggests that the power and position of an organization in society is a central concern. The organization accepts its social duties and participates in some form of social cooperation as part of its business objectives. And so this is a different level of theory, a political and cultural systems level theory. And if you're familiar with systems theory, this is where it puts its emphasis. It views the organization simply as part of a larger system connected in a complex web of relationships. So instead of the dominant logic being driven from economic value, the dominant large logic focuses on lo larger social values, what we care about as a society, how we see society working effectively.
So this is an equivocal approach. It acknowledges that the world is socially created and that any firm's value in and of itself is a social contract. So it must play a part of that, that it argues we cannot separate the organization from society. So this means that an organization has a responsibility to its larger society if we focus on the reputation case for, for business uh, and corporate social responsibility. Then the final case for social responsibility can be viewed in terms of synergistic value creation. Here the key proposition is fundamentally different. It's relating. It means integrating stakeholder interests in order to create value at multiple fronts. This view of value creation is, argues that it's a win-win prospect. It seeks out and connects stakeholder interests, creating a bunch of different definitions of value from multiple stakeholders simultaneously. So examples of perspectives that take on this synergistic value creation as the central argument for social responsibility would be one called the positive synergy or virtuous circle. This perspective highlights positive gains generated through combining slack resources and good management. Second, Sustainable local enterprise networks is a model that emerged from examining 50 case studies of successful and self-reliant sustainable enterprise-based activities in developing countries that results in virtuous cycles of reinvestment in human, social, financial, and ecological capital. A third view on this key value proposition of relating are value-based networks. This describes how communities and social networks can be united by creating a sense of, of what is valuable to create new opportunities for mutual gain. The concept is like the triple bottom line of sustainability that emphasizes synergies that can emerge from organizations, environment, and societies by integrating efforts across those domains. And then the fourth example of a perspective adopting this uh, relating value proposition is societal learning. This is defined as articulating new paradigms that can alter the perspectives, goals, and behaviors of social systems that are larger than any particular organization. Of the three types of learning, single, double, and triple loop, societal learning deals with triple loop learning which involves rethinking the rules of business and society relationships. Although this societal learning is often stymied by double loop learning, which is a reflection on how to play the current game better. So what this means is that the synergistic value creation view looks at firms as social actors that embrace both economic and political roles for business and also extend these towards improving a general social well-being. This isn't a new idea, but it's one based on the presumption that economics and politics are human constructs and so integral to a societal domain. So as a society level theory, what matters is the firm's performance, its industry, and the politics involved to do good work for society. So it argues that there should be a positive relationship between all three of these. Naturally, this is an equivocal based theory and approach that acknowledges that the world is socially created and that any firm's value is a social construct that any organization has to play a part of its society and we can't separate organizations from societies. So each of these can be made as a reason or a rationale for doing social responsibility. Each of these have different value propositions and perspectives that can be adopted. But what this also suggests is that there are some critiques of these traditional cases for social responsibility. Building a business case for CSR implies that we're building a coherent justification for an organization to invest in CSR-defined initiatives. Thus, the problem is justification. So three critiques that recur in CSR's value to organization emerge because of these four very different perspectives. Let's take a look at each of these typical critiques for the cases for CSR. 
when we're talking about the level of justification, we're asking what is the connection between CSR initiatives and their outcomes. The search for definitive causal connections between CSR and profitability has yielded, frankly, inconclusive results because social and financial performance is not always related. It's also an an unreasonable proposition to suggest that being socially responsible is always going to be positively correlated with financial results. So instead of making financial considerations the first and only outcome, it's important to consider multiple levels of benefits to CSR. So seeing self-creation or the financial argument as well as community creation as two sides of the same coin can help organizations to consider the importance of being members of the communities in which they live. That is, there are joint ends of organizational and collective good. The problem of justification is also often characterized by the artificial separation of the economic and ethical justifications for action in social responsibility. The implication is often that the economic action is value-free, that it's simply a fact. Think about it this way. There's a fundamental defect in the construct of CSR itself by asserting that organizations must attend to social responsibilities in addition to business responsibilities. We admit that they are distinct and separable. This is a distinction that's further amplified when we try to justify CSR with a business case. So in 1995, Swanson described several theory-building problems with the separation of economic and ethical, political, social perspectives of CSR research, including one, that a unitary view of organizations is one that tends to stress that the organization is a cooperative enterprise united in the pursuit of a common set of goals. This is a pluralistic view that stresses the diversity of individual goals and interests, and that the formal goals of an organization are an umbrella under which a host of individual and group interests can be pursued as ends. So in a lot of ways, we're debating about the very nature of an organization. Is it a disconnected, simple entity with a unidimensional, stable interest? Or is it an interconnected, complex system with multidimensional, dynamic interests that responsibility is taken for the common good? A further critique of these traditional, these four traditional business cases occurs on epistemological grounds for social responsibility. What's been called the integration dilemma of bringing people together, empirical or descriptive and normative or prescriptive approaches. Empirical inquiry investigates measurement, explanation, and prediction, while normative inquiry focuses on moral ju evaluation, judgment, and prescription of human action. Positive approaches place a distinction between describing and prescribing. So the researcher is supposed to stand as a neutral observer using scientific methods to make contact with reality and then report to managers in an unbiased way. When prescription is undertaken, so when we make recommendations, it's done so on the grounds of assumed goals such as corporate efficiency and wealth maximization. But an anti-positivist approach would suggest that this morally normative approach that admits that there's a subjective, multiple sets of objectives, goals, values, can ground a justification. But the more often that we get focused on these assumed goals of organizational productivity and wealth maximization, it allows us to privilege only one view at a time. There is a pragmatist approach, though, that allows us to employ the criterion of usefulness by focusing on the degree to which people can be helped to cope with the world and create a better world.
So instead of pitting the economic and the social good against each other, a pragmatist approach is a third way that can focus on how these can mesh together. So it takes away the my camp, your camp, and says, what can we do that helps everyone? So as we've analyzed the traditional business cases for social responsibility, this notion of the integral commons is approached in the, in the move from stakeholder management to social integration through a focus on values-based networks with the modes of value creation. So three authors, Kurtz, Cobert, and Wheeler, argue that the modes of value creation are more effectively described and recognized in their recommendations for building an alternative, integral approach to the business case for social responsibility. They argue this leads to a more valuable and useful set of arguments for how CSR fits into an overall organizational strategy. CSR perspectives, they say, need to move beyond reductive approaches of the rational view or these fragmented challenges of radical pluralism that focus on the organization as a part of an integral complex network. This means, then, that organizations are interdependent in their environment and they're complex in the interactions. Causal effects in a complex system, then, can be both linear and nonlinear, and complex living systems, quite frankly, can pursue multiple goals. So if we think about this as a paradigm shift, we can move beyond existing stakeholder conceptualizations to think about social responsibility as being something that connects different social actors together. It draws on insights from the complex natural systems, and then we can use this as a way to be more agile for an organization. That if an organization sees itself as one part of a complex system, it will respond to its environment and changes within the system. This complexity perspective lets us focus on a number of different kinds of outcomes all at once. So what they meant by this, by this integrated commons, is that the capacity for members of the organization to view themselves and their work as part of something larger, whether it's purpose-bound or value chain defined, it lets the organization and the people in it decide for themselves whether the larger purpose is satisfactory. By moving from away from a concept of social responsibility to that of societal responsibility, it emphasizes a move away from creating organizational wealth to the organization itself being an instrument for creating broader societal value. So this view of business as an interdependent system is essential for recognizing the complexity of globalization and the interaction of systems so that social responsibility becomes the foundation for strategic action rather than some add-on that's convenient to do sometimes. This also requires moving beyond a traditional stakeholder model of an organization to an interrelated system or interrelated systems model of business, shifting the assumption of corporations as autonomous or independent activities, applicable to any organization, by the way. So the organization can no longer be autonomous and independent, but that it is has to consider its obligations to the community as an equally important part of the cost of doing business. So their final recommendation for building a more robust business case for CSR deals with the imper importance of ontology and epistemology. They favor an equivocal approach to ontology, assuming that the world is socially constructive, and advocate that the business case for CSR rests in the deep connections between organizations and their communities. As a result, they argue that the pragmatist perspective is better because it acknowledges the complexity and enabling emergence of organizations and their communities to focus on building capacity. So it's more useful because it enables a broader view of value creation for companies. So what this means is that it gives us a different perspective. 
one that is hopefully pragmatic, but looks at the organization as a member of a larger system. So unlike the four traditional business cases, they would argue that this integrated approach is more realistic and is not susceptible to the same kinds of criticisms that the old cases were.